So yeah, the talk that I will be giving today is about the Viral Seek project, um, specifically the work that we did in 2020. Um, and there's a version of this talk that uh, is a bit more up to date uh, coming at some point in the future, but uh, due to the workload that we've had the past few months, I haven't been able to update beyond 2020. So um, I, I still think that it's a, uh, it's a very interesting view into how uh, the viral sequencing project is working in Quebec. And a lot of this is very similar to what is happening in other provinces. So um, just to put everyone um, up to date on how the viral sequencing uh, of uh, SARS-CoV-2 works, um, in Quebec, all, um, we have a biobank, which is maintained by Genome Quebec, uh, where samples collected from hospitals when people get diagnosed with uh, COVID are sent uh, one milliliter of the clinical specimen. So usually the nose swab is sent to this biobank. And then from that biobank, um, a random sampling is done to do sequencing. So the goal for the random sampling has been to sequence approximately 10% of the um, positive cases in the province that are, that are stored in the biobank. And from the, the sequencing that happens mainly at the McGill Genome Center, or in 2020, it was only in the McGill Genome Center, but since then we've added a few more sites for sequencing. Um, we produce raw data, raw sequencing data, that then gets um, assembled into a consensus um, uh, for the viral genome, which has all the potential variants and mutations found in that sample. And then in parallel, the uh, epidemiolo epidemiology team at the public health lab um, assembles a database of uh, metadata that includes, you know, sampling date, geographic location, known travel history in some cases, and that enriched metadata with the genome that we produce is what uh, in the end allows for all the potential uses of this information, including um, analysis of outbreaks or clusters, uh, a, a, a surveillance at a, at a genomic level of the the, num the variants that are in the pop general population. And uh, some of the metadata along with uh, high quality sequences also get uploaded into public repositories. So GSAID and uh, the NCBI um, databases. But uh, recently, actually uh, yesterday, Canada launched its own viral seek prod portal, and I saw someone put the link in the chat. Thank you. Um, where this is going to actually take over some of this public uh, data availability so that other researchers can use it. So that's a big picture of how the actual sample and data uh, flow works in Quebec. It's a little bit different than some of the other provinces, but um, most of them follow a similar scheme. What's actually happening um, is that we have a set of uh, amplicons that tile the whole genome of the virus. Uh, in the beginning, as I said, this, is a, this presentation covers most of our work from 2020. And one of the things that we tested in 2020 were different primer schemes, including one produced by a company called Paragon Genom Genomics uh, and another one by the Arctic Network. In the end, uh, as most Canadian labs, we decided to stick with the Arctic protocol, uh, which is produced by the Arctic network. And essentially what this protocol does, uh, if you can see here in this schema, at the top here, you have a, a graph uh, of the virus reference genome, which includes a few proteins, including the famous S protein. And then you have the primers uh, from this protocol, which are tiling throughout the genome all the way to uh, the beginning and the end. And if you look at the amplicons here in this close up, one thing that you notice is that the amplicons that we have are overlapping each other uh, in, a, in a small region here, for example. 
So here you have what is the left primer for one of the amplicons and the right primer for another of the amplicons. And you have this part here in the middle that's overlapping. And uh, the good thing about this protocol, because of that overlap, means that we can actually have the full sequence of the virus covered from uh, 50 basis into the reference up until 50 basis uh, before the end. And uh, in, on average, each of these amplicons is about 450 base pairs in length more or less. It was an uh, amplicon scheme designed with long reads in mind. Um, but uh, in Quebec, at least, we are not only sequencing using long reads. We actually have two pipelines that we work with uh, for the genome sequencing. We have a short read pipeline, in our case, applied to Illumina. So uh, some of the other provinces are using a version of this pipeline called Signal. Um, the steps are pretty much the same, uh, only in our case, we implemented it using our um, pipeline uh, framework called GenPipes, which allows us to run this pipeline across all Compute Canada clusters pretty uh, reliably. And uh, here you can see all the steps and the parameters that the pipeline goes through. It's a bit crowded, but we have these big categories that sort of give you a clue about what each step is actually doing. So in the beginning for the, the first few steps, what we're doing is removing host reads. So reads that map to the human genome, because we wanna make sure that the data that we're working with and the data that we share has been properly anonymized. Then after we do this host removal, we move on to the trimming, then the alignment using BWA mem. Uh, and then once we have an alignment, then we do some additional filtering from the aligned reads to make sure that we have the insert size that we expect. Given that we know the size of the amplicons, we sort of know also the, the maximum size of the insert between the paired reads, which should be a maximum of 300 um, base pairs. Once we do this additional filtering, we use IVAR, which is a program that allows for um, consensus building and variant calling. Uh, so it also does the primer trimming, the primers that we're used to create the amplicons. We trim them from the, uh, the pileup. And then we do then the proper variant calling with a one call of IVAR. And then using a separate call of IVAR, we build the consensus. And in this pipeline, we do it in two separate steps because um, for the variant calling, which produces in the end the BCF with a list of all the variants that we detected for that sample, we have a lower threshold given that we want to include also prop, uh, low variant allele frequency uh, variants. So variants that are not necessarily the most abundant variant in that particular sample but that could still be interesting for downstream investigations. But for the consensus, we only really wanna include um, really high allele frequency variants. So variants that we are very confident that are the, the, in the majority of the reads in our samples, because the consensus is supposed to represent, you know, the average or the, the as the name says, the consensus of that uh, sample. And then once we produce the consensus and the VCF, we, we do a lot of metrics and plots to make sure that the quality of the samples match our, our internal thresholds. The, the long read pipeline um, is a little bit different. Uh, in the end, it's doing pretty much the same thing. Um, but given that we're working with, an, in our case, nanopore reads, uh, we can also do a, a slightly different filtering. Uh, it's not shown here, but we also, as part of the pre-processing and base calling, we at some point uh, in between the pre-processing pre and the alignment, we do the hosting as well. Um, but uh, the, the filtering works a little bit different because in this case, obviously we don't have inserts, we don't have paired reads, we just have long reads. So in this case, we expect to capture the full amplicon and the, the filtering is just done based on the size of the, the read essentially. And we remove any read that's shorter than what we expect or longer than what we expect. And then we align with Minimap and then we use uh, the Arctic Network Pipeline, which is uh, also um, uh, doing the VCF uh, production, but 
in contrast to the Ivar pipeline, one of the big differences here is that the VCF itself is what we use to produce a consensus. So in this case, uh, also because of the error rate and the, and the long reads, we don't have the ability to detect super low frequency variants because uh, the error rate on Nanopore is so high that, that you're really hampered by that. So we have uh, slightly higher thresholds and the initial variant detection. And we also do the variant calling separately for every uh, Amplicon pool so that in places where we have an overlap, we can actually check that the variant is found in both uh, cases of the overlap. And then once we have our variants, we filter them for quality and then we use that to build the consensus. Um, and again, we, we produce plots and metrics. And uh, that's more or less the general picture of how the pipeline works. So obviously in 2020, when we were, uh, when all of this happened, uh, none of us were expecting to be working uh, with this virus that no one had ever seen. So a lot of the initial work that we did was just validating our, our procedures, both in the lab and bioinformatics. One of the first things that we did, for example, was comparing the way that IVAR, which is our, our current tool for variant detection with short reads com uh, compared to the nanopore. Um, and, and one thing that we noticed, for example, with IVAR is that if you didn't trim the primers, you tended to find uh, some variants that weren't actually found in the nanopore uh, data set. I'm highlighting them here. This is just a stack of the, align the aligned reads with these little lines representing variants that we detected in that early phase. And in the red one, you see what we detected with IVAR and the blue, what we detected with Nanopore. And in most cases, they match, but in some cases they didn't. And we, we pinned it down in the beginning because we weren't trimming the primers and primers are prone to have sequencing errors. So primer trimming was very important. Uh, when we trimmed the primers, we had 100% concordance in this data set. So that, that also is kind of just a summary of the kind of tests that we performed at the beginning. Um, in the end, uh, when we were doing our pilot phase in the first months of the pandemic, uh, we actually sequenced with three different technologies, not just the Lumina short reads, but also MGI, which is another kind of short read sequencer produced by BGI. And as I mentioned, a different Amplicon strategy called CleanPlex by Paragon Genomics. So we were lucky in the sense that we had 41 clinical samples with, that were sequenced with all three technologies. So we could test our pipeline, not just the two different pipelines that we were working with, but different wet lab protocols to make sure that they all matched and validate that the pipeline was producing the same thing. And uh, for 41 of uh, 38 of these 41 samples, we had a full concordance of calls in the SMBs that were detected, so the variants. But um, there were some cases where we didn't. There were three cases where some pipe, uh, two pipelines uh, found the, the thresh, the variant and one didn't. Um, in two of those cases, it was really just a matter of gap of coverage because again, these were separate runs, uh, separate wet lab preparations. We didn't always have the coverage to detect some variants and that's where the discrepancy happened. But in this particular case that I'm showing here, what we noticed is that um, the variant that we were detecting uh, in two of the three pipelines was uh, at a variant real frequency of 75%, more or less, which means that 75% of the reads carried the variant, whereas the, the rest did not. And this is very close to the threshold that we were having. This is also in part what allowed us to set that threshold. And the reason why we went with uh, two different thresholds, one for the VCF and one for the consensus. Um, here in this plot, you can see that MGI uh, have 75, almost exactly percent of the reads had the variant, but in Nanopore and Illumina, it was slightly lower, which uh, meant that when you compare the consensus, uh, the variant, the SMB was present in MGI, but not present in the other two. And this plot is also interesting because it shows us, uh, again, what I was mentioning earlier with Nanopore, the price you pay for the long reads is really in accuracy and error rate, because as you can see with the variant allele frequency for nanopore, it's a little bit all over the place, whereas with Illumina and MGI, whenever you see a variant, you usually see it at a very, very high variant allele frequency, almost 100% of the reads have it. Uh, 
and in Nanopore, even for cases where on the other two technologies we had almost 100%, we didn't have that. Uh, we had a bit of a, a mixed bag. Uh, it's still a very powerful technology and it is very versatile, but it does come with its uh, prices in terms of accuracy, at least at the read level. Um, another of the tests that we did early on to validate our wet lab methods was we did a spike in uh, analysis. Uh, we did it with Nanopore and with Illumina and the, the results with Nanopore kind of confirmed what I just showed you before, which was that the error rate didn't really allow us to detect low variant allele frequency uh, variants. But with Illumina, what was very interesting is that we had this panel where we, we had a clinical sample that had a variant in a position that we knew was absent from a viral culture positive control that we were also using. So we had uh, uh, two positions that we knew we would have the variant in one of the samples and we wouldn't have it in another of the samples. And then our collaborators in the McGill Genome Center in the lab created a gradient where they had 100% of that one sample and then progressively spiking in 1%, 5%, 10%, 20%, and then 50% of the other sample. And when we aligned the reads and we looked into the variant allele frequency in the Illumina pipeline, we saw that it was matching actually quite well um, the spike in. So this is the 1% spike in, and you can see that 99% of the reads have the variant that we have up here, up here, which we knew was in the, in the background, you could say. But 1% uh, of the reads had the other uh, uh, base. And then in the 10%, it was uh, approximately 7%. Uh, the, the, in the 5%, sorry, it was 7%. In the 10%, it was 5%. So these two, it was you know a bit murky. But then when you go all the way up to 50%, it was actually like the, the, the results showed that the Illumina technology could have the sensitivity to detect uh, low variant low variant allele frequency variants quite well, which is part of the reason why we also wanted to have kind of the BCF with a lower threshold, because even if some of these don't make it into the consensus, they could be interesting for other research purposes. So throughout the first year in 2020, as we ramped up gene sequence, genome sequencing, especially during the second wave, we obviously uh, had to go through a lot of uh, troubleshooting. Um, one of the big things that we um, in the lab especially had to deal with was the, the contamination of negative controls. This virus is very, um, because you're working with an amplicon scheme, uh, obviously any even minimal form of contamination gets amplified. It usually gets reflected down bioinformatically in one of two ways. You either have a very low read uh, coverage throughout the genome or a few amplicons that generate a lot of reads in what should be a negative control, which should be a clean sample with no reads mapping. So, um, it just highlighted the fact that uh, it's very easy to get contamination in the process, which is also why when people work with data uploaded to public data sets, you have to be very careful about the QC that you perform on those sequences. Because uh, in our case, we do a lot of QC. Uh, all of the labs across Canada are very careful with this kind of thing. And we have meetings to discuss this, but we are not guaranteed that everything that is on GIS-8 is, is controlled for these kinds of things. And it's actually quite common to see this kind of contamination appear. Another thing that we notice in Quebec, because of the way that the data flows, as I mentioned, we start with the biobank and then uh, a lot of hospitals are submitting samples into the biobank. We don't always have a lot of metadata coming into the sequencing. And one of the important uh, criteria for knowing whether your sequence is gonna work or not from a sequencing perspective is the CT value, uh, which is um, inversely correlated to the viral load when you get tested. So high CT value samples have lower viral loads. And uh, it has been shown across the world and in our internal testing that above a certain CT value, you really don't get enough reads to actually sequence the virus. Uh, 
But as I mentioned before, unfortunately, we don't always have this information in Quebec going into the sequencing. So we couldn't actually filter low CT value samples before going into sequencing. And uh, that was a problem because initially, while well, uh, this is just a plot to show how many of our uh, samples passed our QC metrics, and we have three levels of uh, QC quality from uh, pass, which is a good quality sequence, flag, which is a sequence that has some detected problems, maybe gaps in the consensus, and then rejected, which are sequences that are missing a lot of the consensus or that have other QC issues. Uh, we started out in our production runs um, during the second wave of the pandemic with a relatively high passing rate um, by run when you look at it. But then uh, towards November of uh, 2020, we started noticing a substantial increase in the number of sequences that were being rejected in our internal QC metrics. And obviously this was a problem because these are reagents and, and samples that were not really producing any valuable information. Upon further investigation, we associated it obviously with uh, what we think was a, a high CT value samples. And here I'm just showing how the, the higher you go with a CT, the bigger um, the percent of host reads you have. So more human data that you have in your sample, which is why you don't get a lot of virus data. And you also have a lot of percent N uh, or percent missing data, uh, data in your consensus. And so uh, how, how to filter for these if you don't have a CT value to begin with, well, another thing that we noticed is that in the lab, when they finish the PCR reaction from the Amplicon preparation, they measure the concentration of product that they get. And uh, depending on that concentration, it was actually quite predictive of the success rate uh, for a particular sample. And not only that, we also noticed that certain hospitals were sending us uh, samples uh, that had a lower success rate in general both reflected in the number of failing samples and the number of uh, preparation PCR preps that didn't produce a very high concentration of product. So uh, obviously working with the lab and working with the biobank, we, we highlighted these issues and we implemented a concentration threshold at the end of the PCR step, where if a sample didn't produce uh, at least 20 nanograms per microliter of product after PCR, we just wouldn't sequence it at, at all. And uh, this was in, in place of the CT value, which we didn't have initially. And uh, you can see that the first runs after uh, doing this pre-filtering uh, when the PCR was completed, the number of passing reads increased substantially, and even the number of flag reads was much, much lower than what we had seen before. So this was one of the things that we were doing also with the bioinformatics and the lab in collaboration to improve the, the, the quality of the sequences that we were uh, producing. It had the disadvantage that obviously it's a bit more work for the lab to pre-filter these samples, and it also means that the biobank send us as more samples than what we are expected to sequence because they know that, especially from certain hospitals, a lot of those samples will be filtered out in this step. So what do we use this information for? And again, this uh, presentation was prepared uh, using data mostly from last year. Obviously in recent months, a lot of this data that we are producing is being used to track and monitor the spread of uh, variants of concern uh, in the province. But before that, also um, I'm gonna share a bit of uh, the results that we have from a um, preprint that we published earlier this year where when we did an analysis of the first samples that we, we sequenced uh, in Quebec from the first months of the pandemic, um, we could actually trace back uh, where the introduction events happened in Quebec for that first wave. And just a little bit of context uh, for all of those you, that you remember uh, in Quebec, the, the first wave was, it was a province that was affected the most um, in the first uh, wave of the pandemic. And the initial theory or uh, one of the hypotheses that the public health lab um, set, put forward was that 
Quebec had a spring break that was happening much earlier than some of the other provinces. And people were abroad when, when the pandemic actually began. And so as people came back from their uh, destinations abroad, they imported the virus with them. And that's part of why Quebec was so hard hit those first few months. And uh, to kind of test that hypothesis and to see whether it had any merit from the uh, genomic point of view, we analyzed uh, almost 3,000 high quality genomes produced in those uh, first uh, five months of the pandemic, I would say, up until June 1st, 2020. And uh, you can see in this plot in the left here that uh, especially in the first uh, few weeks, uh, up until mid-March, I would say, we were sequencing almost every case. So the blue here represents the sequences that were analyzed for this preprint, whereas the, the background in gray are the total positive cases for that particular day. And up until uh, mid-March, I would say we were sequencing a big portion of every positive case, but then obviously as the pandemic, the first wave um, got worse, we couldn't sequence the, all of the um, all of the cases. So our our percent sequenced uh, cases goes down. Um, and also uh, to place it in a little bit of context, here at the beginning we have the spring break for Quebec, uh, which is this this period that is marked by the one here. And before that, we had very few instances of of. Uh, positive cases, but it really spiked uh, almost two weeks after the spring break ended and just a few days after the borders were actually closed, which is um, here in, in number three. In those first few cases, the age groups were relatively low, mostly on average people in their 50s or, or younger. But as the first wave got worse, the, the cases that we were analyzing and the cases that were included in this analysis the average age increased because unfortunately in Quebec, the majority of the people affected in this first wave were people in long care homes, which uh, had higher age um, averages than the regular population. So one of the things that became very clear uh, as we uh, did the analyses, and uh, I have to credit I didn't do all of this work myself. It was uh, mostly the work of a postdoc researcher we collaborated with, Carmen Leah Moral. She's the first author in the preprint. Um, what she showed uh, was that um, if you look at the travel history information that was reported from the positive cases, you have uh, this distribution. Um, but it, it, the travel history that we have doesn't cover a lot of the cases that we analyzed because some people weren't or didn't give travel history to the epide epidemiologists. Um, but then when you look at the analysis that we produce and doing the most common, uh, most uh, recent common ancestor analyses on the sequences that we have uh, with a background of sequences from across the world, um, and a higher number of, of uh, sequences, you see that the distribution uh, mostly matches the travel history, but it doesn't actually match it 100%. And you can see that, um, at least in Quebec, the majority of the cases, based on the most common ancestor uh, analysis that she did, were, were imported from Europe or from Latin America and the Caribbean or the US which is, uh, matches a lot of what we know are common spring break destinations from for Quebec travelers, which matches nicely with what we, we had as a hypothesis to begin with. But there are also a lot of samples where the, the background is a bit unclear and it, it just goes on to show that maybe there were some cases that were not being uh, detected and during their introduction. And so the travel history is not necessarily available but that then were detected further down the line as those particular lineages spread. And uh, it became impossible to trace back where the virus was imported from. But in, in the end, one of the things that was very clear, at least compared to other provinces whose uh, data came mostly from um, uh, Asian countries uh, like BC in the early stages of the pandemic had mostly samples be traced back to Asia, 
Uh, in our case in Quebec, it, mo it mostly traced back to Europe, which is markedly different. And then obviously uh, another interesting result from this analysis was that we could uh, do a regional analysis and see the distribution of the virus lineages by region in Quebec and just went on to show how the virus was propagating and the different lineages that were actually uh, in every different region of the province for, for those initial months. And most of the cases that we saw in Quebec were this blue lineage, which is labeled B.1 in the Pango lineage nomenclature. And that was the most successful lineage across Quebec for the first uh, months of the pandemic. So just to summarize, um, the, the 2020 pandemic, uh, or the pandemic, well, the COVID-19 pandemic was very, uh, a very big challenge for provinces uh, and for Quebec, it was no exception. But thanks to our work, um, we could do more than 50 sequencing runs across all three technologies. By the end of 2020, we had sa sequenced more than 6,400 samples. And, um, uh, we uploaded by the end of 2020, this number has increased by a lot, but we uploaded more than 750 samples to Gisade to share with researchers across the world. Um, by the end of the pandemic, uh, the year, sorry, um, we had detected our first case of the UK, famous UK uh, lineage. And uh, these are just some of the stats of how that compares to the rest of the world and in Canada. Uh, so while Quebec had um, 200,000 uh, cumulative cases of COVID-19 in the year 2020, um, Canada reported almost 600,000 uh, by the end of 2020. Uh, and in the world, uh, you know, this was obviously a very devastating pandemic. Um, the picture that I'm showing here in the right uh, is a mural by a Mexican, a Mexican. So this is a mural by a Mexican muralist, uh, Diego Rivera, which is uh, showing uh, kind of like a, a nativity scene, but instead of uh, a nativity, if you look closely, it's a boy getting vaccinated. And it just, uh, I thought it was a very good picture to conclude this talk because thanks to the vaccines, we are now finally seeing the end of this pandemic and they really are a miracle of science. And that's uh, more or less what he wanted to convey. But this actually was produced in 1932. So he recognized all the way back then that vaccines in general are one of our best tools to control uh, infectious diseases. So I just wanna conclude this talk with uh, open data and open science, which made everything that we are showing here possible. These, these samples uh, were shared across the world. The, the information was shared with other provinces uh, and the pipelines that we developed and everything that we have was developed in conjunction with other people across the world uh, and across Canada. And uh, the VirusSeq project and COVID, uh, CoveSeq, which is the Quebec um, portion of this project, has um, greatly provided valuable information to the public health authorities for genomic surveillance and retrospective analyses of how the pandemic was happening uh, in the province. And with that, I'd like to thank all the people that contributed to this project at the McGill Genome Center. Here's the list of all of the people that worked there, uh, on this project at our group in C3G and in LSPQ, which is the uh, Quebec Public Health Lab. And I'll be taking questions. I think there are already some in the chat. Uh, 